the edges of paths right now, probably one of the most abundant places to pick wild food. Down here we've got nettles, cleavers, jack by the hedge. Down here I spotted, yep, some lots and lots of cow parsley. There's some mugwort down here. There's some dandelions, some wood avens over there. Some duck, some hogweed. So much to utilise right now. I am back in the local woods just behind my allotment site and the last time we came for a walk here was in my first ever forager video or my first ever YouTube video actually and everything is looking a lot more lush than the last time I came for a walk here. There are carpets and carpets of wild garlic, the spring flowers are all out, the tree blossom is blooming and yeah it's a beautiful time to be alive. <laughs> Let's see what we can find today. I'm feeling very precarious walking along this mud slip next to this river. <laughs> well, it's not a river, it's a stream. It's a tiny stream. I'm not going to die if I fall in. I can't swim though, so it is a worry. Can you see the little ducks? Hello. There's so much wild garlic in this little spot here. And there's so much dog's mercury about at the moment. This isn't an edible, it's actually a toxic plant but it's a very good indicator of ancient woodlands. So find dog's mercury and you're bound to find lots of other lovely treats. I just found a really pretty little plant down here, let me show you. This gorgeous little plant down here is wood anemone. And it's a pretty little woodland flower that's a really good indicator of ancient woodland as well, like the dog's mercury. And it's not an edible, but it has been used historically as um, a herbal folk medicine, uh, particularly in Russia. And an ointment can be made with this and used to treat your eyes. And it's also been used to help delay menstruation as well. And it is a really, really pretty little plant that has white petals that sometimes have little flushings of pink on the backs of the petals. And it has these beautiful, soft, quite delicate leaves. On a bright day, the flowers are quite open, but when the rain threatens or it starts to head into nighttime, the flowers kind of start to close their petals and droop their heads down. And that just means that if there is a chance of rain, the raindrops will hit the backs of the petals and kind of go down the stem rather than potentially crushing any undeveloped seed heads inside this little cup here. There's a saying that the wood anemone never flowers before the 16th of March and never later than the 22nd of April. As long as I've observed the wood anemone, that seems to be true. Down here on the forest floor, we've got Exidia glandulosa or black witch's butter, which is a cool little saprobic fungi that's just feeding off this little broken branch down here. And We've also got Avernia prunistae, or oak moss. Just found more Exidia glandulosa, and this is a bit bigger <laughs> than the last patch. So this is um, a better specimen to show you. You see how it's got a velvety kind of mat back here, and then on the underside it's a lot shinier and more gelatinous. They used to destroy these for fear of witches. <laughs> Got a beautiful stump of turkey tail. I've just been sticking my face into every tree blossom that I find. And a willow so far smells amazing. This little patch of plants down here is probably one of the most common plants you'll come across in the woodlands at this time of year. It's Heracleum spondylium, or common hogweed. The so common hogweed is a really delicious wild edible, but lots of beginner foragers are quite apprehensive to pick and cook it. And that is with good reason as well, because common hogweed does have a really, really dangerous lookalike called giant hogweed. And that is a plant which does look quite superficially similar at a young age, but once it grows to its full mature height between eight to 12 feet, then it's quite 
quite easy to tell the difference. A really, really good way to tell the difference between common hogweed and giant hogweed is the upper surface of the leaves. So the upper surface of the leaves in common hogweed has kind of a matte feel, whereas on giant hogweed it has a much glossier kind of shinier and smooth upper surface. So on the leaves of the common hogweed, they've got quite a rounded, curved, serrated edge to them, whereas on the giant hogweed, it has a much sharper kind of spinier leaf. And it does look a lot more menacing than the cute little rounded common hogweed. It's quite important to note that plants can take on various forms. So these are all common hogweed leaves and you can see the difference between the serrations in the leaves. And it's just about getting to know your plants, really. You can feel the tops of the common hogweed plant and they've got kind of like little tiny hairs and has a bit of a furry matte feel. Whereas the tops of the giant hogweed have a much smoother kind of shiny feel to the leaves. The stem on common hogweed has little tiny fine hairs covering the entire stem. Whereas on giant hogweed, it has little spikes or spines you can see common hogweed have got this groove that runs all the way down the stem and it will often have a purple tinge or colouring to the stem as well. But you'll never ever see purple blotches like paints, splats or dots on the stem. And if you do, then you've got giant hogweed on your hands rather than common hogweed. There's quite a few nice young hogweed shoots down here and it's this kind of size that you want to be aiming for really I think in my opinion anyway these are the tastiest when the leaves are still curled up like this and chefs pay pretty good money for forage hogweed shoots they're quite a gourmet wild edible and some liken the flavour to asparagus but you can make all the fancy recipes in the world but um, I think just pan fried with some garlic butter is delicious some candle snuff down here some little fresh jellies down here. How beautiful is this crust fungus on this fallen log down here? Just seen some more gorse here. I didn't know this patch of gorse existed. You can always tell which way you're heading when you see a gorse bush like this. So you see how there's more flowers on this side of the bush? that direction the south and then I'm just walking up and seeing more gorse and you see how a majority of the flowers are still in that direction so it's a really really good little natural navigation method find yourself a gorse patch if you get lost <laughs> again I mentioned this in my last foraging video but if you are looking to use these for your desserts or anything like that do make sure that you're picking the flowers from the south side because these ones will have the most flavor it's the sunshine that brings out the oils and gives it that little coconut taste the ones on the other side just taste like peas <laughs> these little hawthorn leaves at this age are my favorite any bigger and i think the flavor changes quite a lot but at this stage I think they're gorgeous. Just fresh straight from the tree. This here is purple rockcress and it's a delicious little edible to pop in your salads and stuff. It's more commonly found as an escapee from gardens and this is um, just on the outskirts of the woodland here growing on somebody's wall. But it's a pretty little plant that provides a really really good ground cover and both the leaves and the little purple flowers are edible as well. And it makes a really pretty addition to your salads and sandwiches. This is Forsythia and it's another one that you'll most likely find in the edges of woodlands where it's escaped from people's gardens. But this is a really really cheery little plant that is really good steeped into witch hazel to make a facial kind of cleansing tonic for your skin. But the flowers are edible too pretty in salads. Harvesting some of these little catkins. They make a really nice little flower that you can use to add to any of your bacon recipes. Muffins and cookies and things like that. So these are really delicious to use in your pancakes. You kind of grind them up and use it to make flour.
Well, you might have noticed that we're no longer in the woods. We are back in my kitchen and that's because my camera ran out of battery a few hours ago. And it's such a shame because I managed to find so many more wild plants that I really wanted to share with you. But we have got a couple of months left of spring foraging, so there'll be plenty of time to go through some more of those plants. But since I am doing a little bit of cooking tonight, I thought I'd show you what I did manage to harvest today and also what I plan on using all of the things for as well. A little basket that I've harvested today. Um, maybe I should get these out so you can see what I've got better. To start this end, we've got some wild Cherville shoots, some cherry plum blossom, forsythia flowers, gorse flowers, common sorrel, some cowslip, hawthorn leaves, flowering currant blossom, a little piece of speedwell. We've got some primrose blossom, some borage flowers some magnolia flowers and buds and up here we've got some currant tops some raspberry shoots scarlet elf cup some ground elder shoots we have got some ribwort plantain jack by the hedge some wood ears hogweed shoots some hazel catkins and a big old bag of wild garlic. So this I actually harvested from my allotment, this wild garlic, as were all of these spring bulbs, or spring flowers rather. We've got some daffodils, some tulips, some psilocyberica, and some grape muscari as well. And these grape muscari I'm actually gonna be using for that color changing drink that was on about in my last video. So yeah, not a bad haul from today. This is gonna go in a cordial. These, I think I'm gonna dehydrate these and turn them into little um, uh, like Turkish delights, but vegan Turkish, Turkish delights. God, that's a mouthful. The Jack by the Hedge is gonna go in a salad, ground onion salad. So most of the greens are gonna go in my salad for tonight. And the catkins will be added to my catkin flower jar as well. And all of this wild garlic will be used for my retreats. I need to make some more butter, some more oil, some more pesto, just like the basic kind of um, staple kind of foods that I can then make more recipes from. So, for example, the garlic butter can then be turned into garlic bread, etc, etc. So, these are going to go in a vase now and everything else I'm going to pop in the fridge until I'm ready to use it later. I love a bit of mise en place. Everything's already... For dinner, I've already chopped up some wild garlic and jack by the hedge for my cod. Um, once that's cooked, I'll top it with the wild chervil. I'm going to make some little roast potatoes with a load of wild garlic. And also a little salsa for my fish out of sorrel, ground elder, a little bit of garlic mustard and some hogweed shoots. And then on the side, I'm going to have pan fried hogweed shoots and some garlic butter that I made the other day. And then dessert is going to be cowslip and primrose ice cream with flour and currant syrup and then tomorrow i'm going to be pickling these magnolia petals these make a really delicious kind of gingery side dish for sushi and they're really really nice um i'm also going to steep my forsythia flowers into some witch hazel make a little face tonic for later um, yeah, tomorrow I'm going to be making these little chocolates, but that's everything for now. Well, I'm going to crack on with dinner now because I am really hungry after that walk. <laughs> I need the secret ingredient for the roast potatoes. Where is it? There we go. Porcini salt. This stuff is banging.